These are the oldest stories, online at oldeststories.net. While Shaushka was speaking to her brother Teshub, the arrow of Lama sped and pierced Shaushka in her breast. A second arrow of Lama sped towards them. Teshub and Shaushka hastened the chariot forwards, but Lama's arrow pierced the axle so that they could no longer move. In the first tale of the Kumarbi cycle, Teshub defeats the agricultural god Kumarbi and takes the kingship of heaven. However, like Wily e. Coyote, Kumarbi always seems to have one more clever scheme to take down Teshub and reclaim his throne. Today's tale has lost its original opening. It begins as I just read to you, in the heat of the action. But even though this and our other tale today are fragmentary, there's still places where we can fill in the gaps to build a pretty good little story. These tales, The Song of Lama and The Song of Silver, both follow a pretty consistent little formula, as I think will become clear. And though modern scholars have a pretty canon set order that these stories occurred in, with Kumarbi at the front, then Lama, Silver, Hadamu, and Olikumi at the end, it seems pretty clear that these were not all written together or in any particular sequence. The Song of Kumarbi, which I read last time, is pretty clearly the origin story upon which these subsequent tales are built, and it seems that the writers of some of these stories were aware that they were operating within an established genre, making references to other Kumarbi tales. But, just like modern superhero tales, many different authors put their stamp on the hero, and there are even clear fragments of stories aside from the five that have survived in good enough shape to be read here. The point is, we shouldn't think of the Kumarbi cycle as a single canon of stories, but as a template out of which the Hurrians built stories. Which is a bit interesting, since we usually think of religious myths in the old days arriving pretty much exclusively out of the temples, usually with some ritual or religious significance attached to it. If you can recall the tale of Tulipanu from episode 60, that was a story with substantial regional variation, but that variation arose as the result of what bad things had happened to the community, which the tale and the associated ritual was trying to correct. And thus, we can think that the audience for the story considered it to be true either literally or symbolically, just as much as modern religious people consider their own religion to be true. However, with the Kumarbi cycle, it's much harder to see what the ritual context is. Perhaps the first tale, as a theogony, bore some merit in praising Teshub, acting as a particularly exciting hymn of praise, or perhaps it had some symbolic value in its conflict between the heavenly gods and the underworld gods. Or perhaps, as some have suggested, it is a historical allegory for the two lineages fighting over a secular throne. But with these additional tales elaborating on the already established themes, it is possible that we have works which were written and preserved solely for entertainment value. I should stress that it isn't clear at all that this is the case, and at least in the original Hurrian context, it may have been different. But as the story is transferred into the Hittite records, which is where we find our surviving copies, whatever ritual context these tales may have had appears to have been removed, or has become a bit too subtle for modern folks removed from the ancient understandings of Hurrian culture to notice. And of course, by the time these tales entered into Greek culture, the old context seems to have been stripped away completely, and these tales turned into myths with completely different purposes. In any case, modern collections of the Kumarbi cycle tend to order the later tales in order of how strong the monster featured is. And so our first story is the Song of Lama. Already at this title, we have something of a mystery. Lama, which can also be read as Kal, is a fairly ambiguous cuneiform sign that can take on many meanings among the many different cultures that use this writing style. Originally, it designates a Lamasu, a female protective deity that would help people to read signs from the heavens. 
As time went on, the Lamassu came to acquire more animal-like features, beginning with wings and eventually becoming a chimera with various animal parts, often either a bull's body and a human head, or perhaps wings as well. It seems unlikely that this is the precise deity being referenced here, though it could well be a local variant, in which the benevolence of the protector is downplayed in favor of the power that a human-animal hybrid can wield in defense of those that it's protecting. However, some believe that this particular tale has its roots in the town of Karchemish, a Hurrian city in modern-day Syria that would be fought over by the Hittite and Mitanni states. If this is the case, then Lama could refer to the husband of the deified Kubaba. You may recall that Kubaba was the first and only ruling queen to feature on the Sumerian king's list, a supposed tavern keeper who became king of Kish. Sometime after she died, she grew into a goddess who protected a few towns, and she and her husband Karhuhi together were the principal gods of Karchemish, a not insignificant Hurrian city. In this interpretation, Karhuhi and by extension Karchemish were at one point in opposition to the correct dynasty of the story, the one protected by Tesh of the Storm God. Whatever the case, the beginning of the tale can be inferred from the structure of other similar tales. For some time, Teshub the storm god was king over the other gods. However, Kumarbi still remembered how Teshub had stolen the throne from him. Having been emasculated, Kumarbi is no longer eligible to sit the throne himself, and likely lacks the power to overthrow the current king. However, he has come to the god known as Lama, and recruited it to be his champion. If Lama is in fact a Lamasu, or some hurry in development on the concept, then he's basically getting a guardian angel to help him out. If Lama is Karhuhi, then perhaps Kumarbi has appealed to the prosperity of Karchemish, or to their shared character as earthy, fertility, non-celestial gods. Whatever the case, Lama comes upon Teshub speaking with his sister Shaushka, a native Hurrian goddess, but one who's borrowed quite a lot from the extremely popular depictions of Ishtar that have come out of Mesopotamia. The Lama sets upon them without warning, striking Shaushka mid-sentence with an arrow to the breast. But despite Lama getting the drop on them, both Teshub and Shoshka are warriors, and by the time the second arrow is in flight, they're already moving towards Teshub's chariot. But though the gods outran the second arrow, it seems that this second missile was not aimed at either of them. Instead, it hit the chariot itself, some key component that would stop it from moving, perhaps splitting the axle. And here we see the very vulnerability of the charioteer, for once they stop moving, they're in danger from rushing enemies. Lama ran forward, following the flight of his arrows. Grabbing a large rock, he threw it at the sky upon which Teshub rode, and shook the very firmament so hard that the stymied storm god fell from the heavens. Now that Teshub is prone and on Lama's level, Lama proceeds to beat on him completing the surprise attack and stealing the reins and whip out of Teshub's hands. While Lama stands gloating, Teshub is too weak to challenge him, but from the dirt he coughs out a warning. You've taken my whip and my reins. These are sacred items, and they carry with them a great burden of kingship, one that you're not worthy of. Others will hold you to account for the obligations you're taking up. Teshub then spat out what seems to be a curse, crying that no mortal woman should henceforth eat of a sheep sacrificed to these objects. It seems that despite being fairly banal tools, the whip and reins were in fact gods in their own right, and recipients of ritual sacrifices, and disincentivizing these sacrifices would be a blow to Lama's kingship. Mortal men also receive an injunction, probably something similar, though the content is lost here. Both Tesseb and Shaushka survive this encounter and scurry away to heal. Lama, meanwhile, heads to a place called the Kalistawara House, some sort of divine sanctuary where the various gods can meet. 
Here, he presents rain and whip before Ea and some of the other gods. It's curious to note that if this were a Mesopotamian story, the symbols of kingship on display would likely be a scepter and mace, the traditional tools of the Near Eastern king. But here, it's the tools of a charioteer that embody kingship, showing just how dominated by the noble Marianu chariot warriors the Hurrians are at this point. The Mitanni political structure may well extend no farther than demanding obedience to the Marianu charioteers, but that is simple and effective enough to have influenced depictions of the Hurrian gods themselves. What follows is mostly a discussion between Lama and Ea, in which Ea evaluates the fitness of Lama for the position of kingship. But, having the symbols of kingship in hand, it seems that Ea can find no valid reason to deny Lama what he's already won, despite appearing to have misgivings about Lama's character. Finally, Lama rejoices, for with Ea's words, Lama is now king in heaven, and he ascends into the sky to take up his throne. Once Lama gets there, he announces to the assembled peoples of heaven and earth that party time is now to commence. He eats, he drinks, he has quite a good time, and as he does so, the world falls into a deep peace. For nine years, Lama was king in heaven, and in those years the wolves became vegetarians, cuddling at night with the sheep to keep them warm. All the cloth woven in the world was exceptionally beautiful. Everyone had great clothes. Everyone drank large quantities of alcohol, especially the premium Tawal and Walhi beers. It isn't clear what happens in the nighttime, but it seems to involve lots of butter, possibly for the extensive feasting, but also possibly for more advanced debauchery. Everyone within the gates of the cities was partying, and even out in the wilds, the mountain streams flowed with beer and wine. The valleys and rivers flowed with more alcohol, and all the humans of the mortal realm were well off. Mankind was fully content with their lives. Now, it turns out that being fully content with your life is actually a terrible, terrible thing. Now that there was nothing but continuous partying, humanity neglected their religious rituals and stopped sacrificing to the gods. Even up in heaven, the various rituals that the gods themselves perform were being ignored. Apparently, the gods have regular meetings, sort of like a heavenly united nations. But Lama was interested only in partying, not boring meetings. And so these were all cancelled. Now, it isn't clear how long this state of affairs went on, whether it took nine years for anyone to say anything about it, or if the gods started complaining earlier, but it takes a little bit longer to get Lama off the throne. But after a broken section of text, Lama is on his way to the goddess Kubaba, which is perhaps the strongest indication that Lama is in fact supposed to be read as her husband Karhuhi. In fact, if he is heading to go visit his wife, then this particular rebuke makes quite good sense. Kubaba tells Lama that she's just gone to visit the great elder gods, the primeval gods who stand in the background of all these stories somehow. They are, in a sense, the gods of the gods, though they do not appear to be active in any of the surviving stories. They are one of those really cool things that you can let your imagination go wild on, filling in gaps for something that could be really cool. The gods of the gods from some primeval origin time. What could they even be? We don't know. Anyway, Kubaba has given them a formal state visit on Lama's behalf, probably without him even knowing or caring, given his general irresponsibility. She urges him, however, that Lama needs to be visiting them personally and bowing before them. Lama replies to Kubaba, saying, The primeval gods are great. They have arisen, but I do not fear them at all. Do I not put bread into their mouths? The paths which the winds are to come and go along, those I, Lama, allot to the gods. However, 
Those very winds betrayed Lama, for the evil wind carried his words along to Ea, where Ea could hear this irresponsible blasphemy. Ea was furious and ran over to Kumarbi. He urged Kumarbi that they must both return to the palace of the gods. This Lama, who they had sponsored to become king, has become unforgivably complacent. And since the ways of the earth follow the ways of heaven, the nations of the earth have also become complacent. Just as Lama now refuses to give offerings to the primeval gods, so too do the mortals now refuse to give offerings to the main gods. Ea and Kumarbi are in agreement. This situation cannot be allowed to stand. And so they both turn away from each other and head to different cities. Ea to the town of Apzua and Kumarbi to Tuttle. I don't actually know the significance of each city aside from the fact that they were both decently sized Hurrian towns, not far probably from Hittite territory, and it's likely that each had a cult center there. Ea's first task is to send off a messenger to Lama, informing them that ever since he's been made king in heaven, he hasn't done anything. He has not overseen the sacrifices to the primeval gods. He has not demanded sacrifices from the mortals. He has never convoked any assembly of the gods and many other failings besides. The fact that everyone seems to be quite happy appears to be entirely beside the point. Lama is a terrible king, at least in part because of the peace and the partying, not despite that. Oddly, when the messenger went to Lama and delivered Ea's rebuke, my translation says that Lama heard Ea's words and began to rejoice within himself. I have no idea why Lama would be happy to get this news. It seems likely that there's an error somewhere in the text I have, either a misreading of the clay tablet or an error on the tablet itself. In any case, Ea then spoke to his vizier named Izumi, and told him to go down to the dark earth and to speak to Ea's brother, Nara Napsara, and to deliver a message. Lama, Ea's message began, has made me angry, and so I've deposed him from the kingship in heaven. Ea's message then repeats the charge of complacency and neglect of divine duties. But of course, simply declaring the king to be illegitimate is not enough, and the message continued, Nara, my brother, hear me. Mobilize all of the animals of the earth and build a great army of nature and assemble upon Mount Nasalma and upon Lama's head we will rain destruction. Now, at this point, what remains of the story is damaged, with large chunks missing and only fragmentary sentences remaining. That says we can still put a little bit together, a tale of triumph here at the end. It isn't clear where Kumarbi goes, but it is possible that he heads over to where Teshub has been hiding for the past nine years. Kumarbi explains that everyone on Earth has spent nearly an entire decade happy and partying, and Teshub immediately nods, agreeing that this sure is a disaster. There's been far too much peace and feasting in both the Earth and Heavens. Kumarbi lets Teshub know that Ea has removed his blessings from Lama, and that the kingship is once again open for a legitimate challenger. And then, he informs Teshub that Lama has a particular weak spot at a certain part of his body, his ikdu, though the translation for that body part is unknown. With this information, and the implicit or perhaps explicit blessing of the other gods, Teshub calls up his buddy Ninurta, who is, of course, the god of action heroes, the most awesome of Sumerian gods, and it's quite nice to see him here, even though we don't actually hear from him. They rise up to assault Lama. Then, in a great and epic battle, Lama is defeated, his ikdu gets cut up, and his body is trampled by Tesib or Ninurta's chariot. But gods don't typically die in Near Eastern myth, and once Lama is at Teshub's mercy and Teshub has regained the throne of heaven, Lama gets on his knees and begs Teshub for mercy. 
Lama cries out that in former days he had certain ritual duties and a certain place in the cosmic order that was somehow essential for the harmony of heaven and earth. Thankfully, Teshub showed mercy on Lama in exchange for his undying loyalty, granting him the position in heaven that he had once possessed. Lama drank from the cup offered by Teshub, confirming his status as a vassal god, and the situation of heaven has successfully returned to what it had been before all this, and to what it presumably was for a Hurrian worshipper. But just because all is right in heaven doesn't mean that Kumarbi still isn't looking to upset the apple cart. And in our next story, he makes another attempt. This one is called the Song of Silver, and it's unique because though it's extremely fragmentary, one of the fragments that does survive is the opening, in pretty good condition. All the stories may have opened with similar formulations, and it's a telling look at the monster of the week. It begins, Among Teshub, the sun god, Shaushka, Nineveh's queen, and all the gods, no one worships him, though his power is greater than their power. His word is greater than their word. His wisdom is greater than their wisdom. His battle glory is greater than theirs. It is silver the fine of whom I sing. Wise men, the introduction explains, told me the tale of the fatherless boy. It did not previously exist in writing. Long ago, Silver's tale had disappeared, and the people did not know his splendor. Heroic men ran to battle. Abundance did not exist. Grain did not grow. The people went hungry. And the introductory fragment ends on this. Apparently, it's pretty terrible not to know Silver's story. You won't have any abundance unless you listen to the end of this podcast. It may at first seem odd that Silver is explicitly built up as being stronger and greater than the primary gods. But if you think about it, this makes sense. After all, how do you build up excitement for a Superman villain? You announce that this new villain is stronger than Superman himself. We all know that Superman, or in this case the main gods, will win in the end. But to fight and defeat a foe stronger than yourself is always the better story. Perhaps more interesting is the sideways claim that this story may have been completely made up. Now, it can be hard for modern literate people such as myself to really get into the head of an oral culture, and it may legitimately be that this tale existed in oral tradition and only now for the first time is being preserved into clay. But I think that there is a chance that the scribe's emphasis on how no one at all recognizes or remembers silver is a little wink at the audience that what follows could be a purely fictional tale, not a religious one that should inspire anyone at all to begin worshipping Silver. But the identity of Silver, like the identity of Lama in the previous story, is a bit of a story in itself. The word itself is written just like the metal Silver. There is no special character which usually accompanies the name of a god, telling us that Silver is not actually divine. He could be a regular human with a god for a father, a demigod with boosted powers, not unlike Gilgamesh or the Greek Hercules. There are also some scholars who take it literally and think Silver is an anthropomorphic lump of metal. In this view, his name is not just a name, which would in any case be a pretty strange name among Near Eastern cultures, but a description of what he literally is. This sounds odd, how does Silver the metal walk around and do human things, but it isn't really that different in principle from fairy tales about anthropomorphic talking animals. We've already seen plenty of tales about weapons and wagons talking just in this cycle itself, and next week we'll be seeing a lump of rock attempting to defeat the gods, so it isn't that far out of the range of possibility. The next fragment we have concerns Silver's birth. 
We don't know who his mother is. Her name does not survive anywhere that we have. But our best guess is that she was a mortal woman who had been impregnated by Coomerby. While relations between gods and humans are much rarer in Near Eastern myth than in the famously philandering Greek tales, we do have a model for it in the myth of Ilyanka, covered in a bonus episode some months back. In that tale, the Hittite storm god married a beggar's daughter, specifically for the purpose of creating a mortal champion who would have the strength to get vengeance on the god's behalf. It's likely that this was Kumarbi's plan as well, giving birth to a demigod warrior who will go and seize the kingship and secure the throne for Kumarbi's line. The birth itself sounds incredibly difficult, with silver only coming after ten months in the womb and the mother's tears flowing like streams from the pain. We don't know how much is missing after the birth, but our next scene sees young Silver playing in the streets with another boy. Apparently all the poor kids hang out together, and Silver is nothing if not a poor kid. The other boy is irritated Silver, so he grabs a stick and smacks the boy with it. The fatherless boy cries out and says, Why are you hitting me, Silver? That wasn't nice at all. You are a fatherless child just like the rest of us. As they say, sticks and stones can break bones, but words can hurt forever. And Silver begins to cry and run to his mother. He cries to his mother, saying that the boys in the street called him fatherless, and said he was only hitting them because they defied him. Which, goodness me, Silver must be quite the chap, hitting the little boys because they won't do what he tells them. After a bit of blubbering, he says to his mother, I struck a boy with a stick, and he spoke evil words to me. Wah, wah, wah. To me, this seems like a perfectly reasonable series of events, but having been around some young children lately, I can see that their understanding of cause and effect is, in fact, often impaired. But the point of all this is to let us know that Silver is living in a single-parent household with his mother. Also, it is an early indication that he really likes to beat people with sticks. Whether the missing fragments tell us who is his father or not, Silver has not yet learned that truth, and is only now encountering his fatherless condition for the first time. His mother calms down the weeping Silver, and once things get settled, Silver asks his mother where his father is. She gives an evasive answer, and so Silver smacks his mother with the stick that's still in his hand. His mother is unimpressed and takes the stick away from him, snapping, Do not hit me, Silver! Patriarchy or not, hitting your mother with a stick is always a bad move. Still, though, it was, in this case at least, partially effective, for his mother does end up telling him about his father. Your father, she tells him, is Kumarbi, patriarch and patron of the city of Urkesh. He watches over the people of Urkesh and lives in that city. He is a just and fair god, watching over the oaths of the land. Your brother is Teshub, who is king in heaven and king of all the land, the mighty storm god. Your sister is Shaushka, who is the divine queen of the city of Nineveh. You have no cause to fear any god except your father, for he is the one with the power to rile up enemy lands and wild animals to destroy that which he finds displeasing. Silver listened to this in stunned silence, overawed by the sudden revelation. There was no question of what he must do. He immediately walked out of that house as soon as his mother had stopped speaking and walked to the city of Urkesh. But when Silver arrives there, he finds that while Kumarbi's temple is certainly present and maintained in the highest opulence, his father is actually out wandering the hills for whatever reason. What happens next occurs in a gap, and so is a bit obscure. But it seems that when Silver is finally reunited with his absentee father, things don't go so well. Silver realizes that not only is he descended from a god, he's actually supremely powerful. 
Hitting orphans on the street with sticks is nothing compared to what Silver can really do, and soon he and his father have a falling out. Silver proves that he's more powerful than his father, beating the tar out of him. And before anyone knows what's coming, Silver is at the doorstep of Teshub, king in heaven. Unlike Lama, Silver is not going around asking anyone permission for any kingship. Silver smacks Teshub right off his throne, beating up anyone who challenges him. We're missing a lot of what happens in Silver's violent rise to power, but it seems he confronted a wide number of gods. Having defeated one whose name isn't preserved, we have an order to send the defeated god into exile down into the dark earth, where he must be beaten with a stick until he becomes compliant. With this, a large number of gods came to the heavenly palace to offer submission to Silver. The new king looked at these losers and began passing judgment on them, a generally harsh set of sentences meant to bring them into fuller compliance and violently cement his dominance over heaven. In this manner, Silver seized power with both hands. Having seized power, the next thing he seized was his spear. Spear in hand, he vaults up to the sky, grabbing sun and moon with his free hand and pulls them down from the heavens. Shaken and with a spear in the face, sun and moon were the next to bow and give reverence to silver. They plead for mercy, begging him not to kill them. We are the lights of heaven and earth. We are the torches of what lands you govern. If you strike us down, you will be forced to rule over lands covered in darkness. Fortunately, in this case, Silver's heart had some love in it for the sun and moon, and he took pity on them. The fragment ends there, so we don't really know what became of these two, though presumably they got along just fine, since the sun and the moon are still in the sky right now. In our next fragment, we see Teshub sitting in a room with his brother Tasmisu. Apparently, not only was Tesha beaten, but he made a pretty poor showing of himself during the fight with Silver, having been so overpowered that he appeared to be completely unresisting. Tasmisu asks his brother, Have you lost the ability to thunder, brother? Do you not know how to fight? Can you believe this nonsense? Silver has become the king, and now he drives all the gods like a harsh slaver, whipping us all into line with his wooden stick. But Teshub rebukes Tasmisu, saying, You need to calm yourself. Let's sit and have dinner. Eating may improve your mood and allow us to look at this situation rationally. Our father An could not defeat Silver at full strength. Now that we're all weakened beneath his rod, how are we supposed to find victory? Neither had a good answer to that, but each took the other by the hand, and they set out, two brothers, on a quest to find victory against the god who had caused so much damage to the world order. They arrive at Silver City and enter into his throne room. Teshub and Tashmisu are terrified of Silver. They know they can't beat him. They know that probably the combined might of all the gods can't beat him. But most likely, the two brothers battle Silver once again, and once again, the two brothers fail. But in the end, Teshub is victorious. Whether through battle, trickery, or both, Silver is deposed from his heavenly throne, and the cosmos is returned to Teshub's rule. How? Did the storm god manage to defeat this unbeatable foe? What sort of vulnerability did they find in the greatest of opponents? No one has any idea, because the tablet which recorded the climax of this story is lost. One tantalizing possibility is that it is Kumarbi who defeated Silver by using his power to unleash forces outside the Hurrian nation his control over enemy nations and wild beasts to destroy their own country. If this is the case, it could suggest that the story has its roots in a particularly dark time, when much of the Hurrian nation was overrun by invaders, battered by natural forces, and oppressed by a cruel king. Only with the defeat of Silver's kingdom 
could Teshub finally pull down the brutal tyrant. However, this is speculation based on the slimmest of threads. We don't really know what happens. The only thing we can do is hope that someday the Mitanni capital is uncovered by archaeologists, for surely the ending of this tale and the details of many others are preserved there, waiting beneath the earth for the day when they can once again be sung out. But for now, we work with what we have, even when it's sometimes frustratingly incomplete. While that may be all we can say about the tale of silver, there are still two more somewhat complete tales in the Coomerby cycle, including, I'm happy to say, the most complete of all the tales. We will see two monsters, one of sea and one of stone, temporarily depose Teshub as king in heaven, and, most excitingly, we will see some character development that brings a close to the endless cycle of usurpation. So join us next time to hear about Coomerby having sexual intercourse with inanimate objects in an attempt to reclaim the kingship of the gods. Thank you for listening.